<clears throat> okay, the, this is another nice long report by the McKinsey uh, company which provides some pointers to the energy transition and more region-specific agenda items for near-term action uh, going up to 2030. So we have looked at the global picture of net zero transitions required. We have looked at net zero emissions, uh, energy systems, and so on. This offers a bit more details on what are the region-specific issues on, in terms of uh, carbon intensity, fossil fuel dependence, uh, need for deploying renewables, and the acceleration needed to meet the commitment goals to global warming targets or NDCs and so on. And also considers uh, the uh, country's abilities or uh, resources in terms of uh, precious m minerals like cobalt, nickel, copper, uh, lithium and so on. I'm not going to go into those details, a very long report as I said. I'm going to just condense it and make a few points and obviously the, the report is available online. You should go read it if you're interested in these sorts of uh, details. The report basically divides the countries into five main archetypes based on key energy transition characteristics. So short-term risk, relative energy security and CO2 intensity. CO2 intensity is important. You want to reduce fossil fuel dependence. You want to also reduce carbon intensity, so energy intensity of the GDP and carbon intensity of the energy and so on. And doing that, you get uh, five classifications, as we said. Uh, affluent energy secure countries, affluent energy exposed countries, and large emissions intensive economies and in the next chart we will look at developing naturally endowed countries and then developing at risk countries so this is the next chart here that we'll go into so the axis here goes from higher to lower in terms of short-term fossil fuel reliance and emissions intensity so both have to be looked at in terms of the need for near-term actions and this is the disposable financial resources and capital in terms of per capita GDP in dollars so uh, obviously intuitively you know that China and India are down here in the uh, uh, scale or in this phase space in terms of fossil fuel reliance and emissions intensity being higher and per capita GDP being lower for example whereas the affluent energy exposed countries uh, have have higher uh, per capita GDP and lower short-term fossil fuel reliance and emissions intensity, but they have uh, energy exposures that have to be considered. The countries here, so here you have China, India, South Africa, here you have Japan, South Korea, uh, Poland, Chile, Greece, Hungary, Portugal, Kuwait, Spain, Czech Republic, and so on. So you have many Middle Eastern countries here as well, like Kuwait and uh, Emirates. And you have uh, progressive EU countries like Germany and uh, Israel also from the Middle East and you inch up into these affluent energy secure countries so Netherlands is on the border right there similar to Portugal from this side but you have Saudi Arabia which is uh, affluent uh, and energy secure uh, and United States which is a uh, very high GDP and energy secure affluent country and of course you have Denmark, Sweden, Canada, France, Finland. So France, for example, has uh, fossil fuel reliance and emissions intensity scale ending up here, but it uh, also has lots of nuclear resource, which is considered a renewable energy. So we will look at various uh, uh, issues that are associated with energy transitions for these types of countries. Looking again at the uh, developing naturally endowed countries, you have uh, countries that have fossil fuel resources or renewable resources as well in terms of Argentina, Morocco, Egypt, Philippines, Peru, Brazil, Mexico and Uruguay. Uh, so the per capita GDP here is higher for these countries which are developing but also naturally uh, endowed. And 
and you have countries that are developing and at risk you expect African countries down here so you have Kenya Senegal Nigeria Ghana Honduras from the Western Hemisphere Indonesia Vietnam uh, Philippines straddle the boundary here between being naturally endowed and uh, at risk uh, Colombia Thailand Malaysia is down here rich but uh, at risk from uh, f uh, fossil fuel uh, reliance and energy intensity okay so the share of renewables in primary energy consumption globally has risen which you think is a good sign but if you keep in mind that the co2 is still increasing continuously uh, it's not such a great uh, transition yet but fossil fuels still predominate uh, obviously because of that primary energy consumptions in exajoules we are looking here in 2011 16 21 and you can see that oil has somewhat reduced coal has reduced but not nearly enough uh, as it should uh, in terms of its impact on not only uh, emissions and global warming but also health and so on. Natural gas has increased. Uh, there are various reasons especially going into 2021 and also some of the European countries are beginning to mention natural gas as a low emission uh, fossil fuel which is gives them a little bit of wiggle room in transitioning to renewables and heading towards net zero so you go away from oil and coal and you go to natural gas call it low emission but that's just a trick that's not really uh, good in the long run so here is nuclear energy almost the same renewables have gone from nine percent to eleven to thirteen percent uh, but that's not really a whole lot and you consider the uh, trajectory we need to be on. In terms of uh, installed capacities in gigawatts, uh, total renewables to have gone from 1330 to 3064, so that's uh, quite a nice jump there. Uh, out of that solar and wind have gone from 294 to 1674 so that's 55 percent of the renewables which is good energy. So others include hydropower, marine bioenergy, geothermal energy and so on. So keeping that in mind where do we need to go? The world needs to bend the curve to achieve net zero emissions so we are now going to 2030 in terms of the global warming targets where we need to be by 2030 so these are net energy related annual emissions by scenarios uh, in metric gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year 2022 to 2030 you remember CO2 equivalent includes non CO2 greenhouse gases and we are looking at various countries and it's not even uh, very important to see which countries are doing what but looking at the gigaton CO2 equivalent uh, emissions per year the current trajectory is here for 2030 and that in the current trajectory would imply a 2.4 degree C rise in global temperature by 2100 while the achieved commitment scenario would lead to a rise in global temperature of 1.7 degrees C by 2100 which is below 2 degrees C which is uh, much better in terms of the global warming targets of course 1.5 is what everybody is dreaming about but as we have said before these rely on technological promises of carbon capture and biofuels and so on which uh, may or may not be realized unfortunately as of now uh, scalability etc. Uh, projected gap between achieved commitments and correct trajectory here scenario by 2030 is 2.4 gigaton per year CO2 okay so this is what we have to uh, hit in terms of uh, accelerating the renewable energy installations. So the acceleration in renewable energy installations required to achieve commitments varies among regions and the main purpose of this report is to look at those region specific uh, issues for uh, near term action to 2030 in terms of energy transitions. So these are the countries uh, looking at Africa, Australia, China and so on. Looking at 2016 to 2021 in terms of average yearly installed capacity of solar in gigawatts and then where they need to be by 2021 to 2030 uh, in terms of again gigawatts uh, installed capacity and the acceleration required uh, in installations to be on track for the transitions to the uh, committed uh, global warming targets or uh, Paris agreements, NDCs and so on. 
we don't need to go into the details but you see that Africa needs to accelerate by 11 times Australia is much better uh, there are like for example Japan needs to only accelerate by 1.4 times whereas China has to go 1.7 so it's done uh, pretty well whereas country like India has to accelerate 8.5 times which is lagging quite a bit in terms of where it needs to be by 2030 obviously these also imply for their own energy security they need to do this and reduce their dependence on fossil fuel uh, looking at the other part average yearly installed capacity of wind in gigawatts for 2016 to 2030 uh, it has to be 16 times for Africa Australia almost four times China 1.8 times so China is doing remarkably well in that sense but India needs to accelerate 5.7 times and Japan here needs to go up 8.3 times and even the US has to go up 2.6 times and see in solar needs to go up 3.3 times which is worse than China for example because China has been leading the transition to renewables in terms of deploying uh, solar and wind uh, for its own energy security and not necessarily always for uh, you know global action as such um, this is a complicated uh, figure with the numbers here which we will not get into because I don't want to get into the details here but a massive increase in deployment of renewable energies will be needed to fill gaps between energy production and consumption so we are looking here at production versus consumption for key commodities exajoules per year in 2021 in terms of oil gas and coal and then it's export and import so you can see Africa here is producing 30.3 internally consuming 18.0 uh, export implied is 12.3 but if you look at high import countries like China uh, European Union and India Japan for example uh, they need to uh, reduce the imports uh, and of course uh, accelerate the deployment of renewable to uh, reduce their fossil fuel dependence they also need to of course reduce the carbon intensity and they need to this obviously will also help them be energy independent or at least buffer their dependence on market forces in terms of fossil fuels which got clearly exposed during the Russian invasion of Ukraine for example uh, the perturbations to the markets we have discussed in a couple of podcasts have been pretty massive and will persist for some time because the war shows no signs of uh, going away anytime soon so you can see that uh, India and China and even Europe have massive uh, work to do in terms of reducing their fossil fuel uh, dependence and uh, accelerating uh, implementation of renewable transitions the energy mix of regions differs substantially although fossil fuels remain the prevalent source of primary energy primary gen primary energy consumption by fuel in exajoules in 2021 looking at oil natural gas coal nuclear hydroelectric and renewables again the idea is in this report to look at region specific numbers so here where Africa China uh, Europe India Latin America Middle East Southeast uh, Asia and the United States and obviously China and India are booming economies and they will continue to grow in their energy demand and energy consumption and China is doing well in terms of nuclear hydroelectric electric and renewables renewables but uh, fossil fuels especially coal here remains a massive part of the primary energy consumption uh, similarly for India renewables are small percentage so if you look at fossil fuel share versus uh, emissions uh, per GDP in tons of CO2 equivalent per dollar uh, fossil fuels remain high for every country so even for a country like United States which is rich and uh, uh, has resources the renewable percentage is fairly small most of it is still dependent on um, 
fossil fuels. So obviously transitions are needed for all countries. As we already mentioned, countries can be ranked by three dimensions of the energy transition, affluence, short-term risk, and long-term opportunity. So these are the defining attributes going from low to high. And you have affluent energy secure countries that we looked at where affluence is high, short-term risk is low to medium, long-term long -term opportunity is high. Uh, for affluent energy exposed countries like Israel, Singapore, Germany and Japan, affluence is high of course, short term risk is relatively high and long term opportunity can be low or high. For Israel it's high in terms of uh, wind uh, for example and solar. Large emissions uh, intensive economies like China, India and Af uh, South Africa have uh, low affluence, high short term risk and varying long term opportunity. None of them have high long term opportunity other than South Africa. It has high short term risk, high long term opportunity. So for details of what these mean you can look up the report. Uh, developing naturally endowed countries Morocco, Egypt, uh, Mexico, Brazil again low income similarly developing at risk countries like Nigeria, Venezuela, Indonesia, Thailand low incomes various levels of short term and short term risks and long term opportunities. Okay so uh, I will make this into two podcasts because this is a very long uh, report and I have plenty of points to make even though I'm being brief. Uh, so the chapter's third one looks at globally eight sets of common actions that are needed for a more orderly energy transition. So I'll just uh, read the main points and each point has details in it that you can find in the report that I'm going to not put all down here. Physical building blocks, four of the eight sets of actions we identify fit into the category of physical building blocks. Streamline access to land, accelerating, per, uh, permitting and simplifying processes to accelerate time to deployment for renewable and clean tech. This is true for uh, across the globe and then we we'll look at region specific recommendations as well uh, just for India as an example. Secondly, modernizing and repurposing legacy infrastructure and creating new assets to accelerate the integration of renewables and clean tech into the energy system. Uh, so there are other details here which I won't read. Strengthening global supply chains to secure critical raw materials, components and labor competencies. So this is an opportunity also to uh, for new uh, employment for example. Decarbonizing the industry and transportation sectors by investing in new technologies, electrification and energy efficiency. Okay, seem obvious but still we need to uh, put them down. In terms of economic and societal adjustments needed, two of the sets of potential actions are in the category of economic and societal adjustments. Uh, fifth one here of being in the list, limiting and mitigating emissions intensive generation to reduce the carbon footprint of fossil fuels and lower the risks for stranded, stranded assets. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, leaving natural gas, coal and oil in the ground, which is what we call stranded assets, we need to limit and mitigate emissions intensive generation so that we can use fossil fuels for the energy transition without making the carbon footprint worse and worse. So energy intensity has to decrease along the way as well for production and for economic growth. Managing economic dislocations to promote energy affordability, affordability and create fair opportunities for affected and at-risk communities. Okay. Finally, governance, institutions and commitments. The final two sets of possible actions are in the category of governance, institutions and commitments. Seventh one then, developing stable and attractive remuneration frameworks, market designs and offtake structures to encourage investments in renewables and clean tech. So you want the financial industry uh, and the investment community also to move towards green and there are uh, networks like the network for greening the financial system and so on which are pushing in this direction. There are impact investments which look for investments in green projects and uh, corporations and so on committing to net zero etc. But here we are talking about commitments towards the energy transition. Um, finally scaling frameworks and standards to measure uh, 
carbon intensity of energy and final products and develop a global new carbon economy. So that's what is needed. So investing in developing and modernizing the power grid will be crucial to ensure that areas with high potential for renewable generation are integrated and connected with demand centers. So grid renew, uh, reorganization and modernization is an issue everywhere including rich countries with resources like the US or uh, Japan or wherever else. So let's leave this podcast here and come back and look at regions and how they uh, need to uh, take near-term climate action or near-term actions for energy transitions to hit the goals of uh, global warming target commitments by 2030. Okay, so let's come back and do that in the next podcast.